to the book of Ruth. And as you're turning there, Testament to the book of Ruth, and we want to look for, at verses 2 and 3, Ruth chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3, and Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace, and she said unto her, go my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, which was of the kindred of Elimelech. Now we want to share some thoughts this evening on the, the book of Ruth and, and the relationship between Boaz and Ruth. And I think we find that in the scriptures there's more than just one illustration of Christ and His church in the Old Testament. We're studying uh, Wednesday nights now on the Song of Solomon, uh, which is, uh, I believe, sets forth a type of Christ and His church. But there are, are many others in the scriptures. And Lest someone think, well, you're, you're kind of stretching some of these things and all. I, I want us to notice over in the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 22. Paul says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. Uh, and the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendered the bondage, which is Agar. And, and he goes on. And the point is, that God in His, his sovereignty. We read the historical account. These were real people. These were the things that transpired in their lives. But God in His sovereignty so allowed these things to come to pass, arranged for them to come to pass, as to set forth deeper truths and, and they stand as a type or as Paul says here an allegory of, of spiritual truths and that's what we're looking at tonight how the relationship between Boaz and Ruth uh, represents to us a, 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 the relationship between Christ and His people particularly Christ and His church. And so, as we look at this, now in chapter 1 and verses 1 through 14, we have some background as to who is Ruth and, and how did this come about. And so, we read there in the first chapter, there was a man by the name of Elimelech, a Jew. Uh, he was uh, from the town of Bethlehem, Judea. Um, this was during the time of the judges. There was a famine in the land. It said, a, a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, 
went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So there was a famine in the land and he decided to uh, cross over the Jordan into the region of Moab uh, to dwell there. And so he was married, his wife is Naomi, and he had two sons. While they are in the land of Moab, he dies. And so that leaves his wife a widow with her two sons. And as they continue in the land of Moab, the two sons marry two women that are Moabites. Opa and Ruth. And then eventually the two sons die also. And so Naomi is left alone. Her husband is dead. Her two sons are dead. Uh, she just has her two daughter-in-laws who stay with her and help her. And she hears that God has blessed now and, and there is food in the land of Israel once again. And so she determines to return but I understand that in the economy and the, the customs and the way of life at that time, the woman didn't really possess property. And, and the woman was uh, dependent upon her husband or upon her sons to take care of. Now she had no sons left to take care of. She had no husband. And, but she's going to return to her people, return to uh, Bethlehem of Judah. And as she leaves, her two daughter-in-law start out with her. Uh, but she tells them, look, I can't offer you anything. Won't you go back, go to your own people, return to your families, and verse 12, chapter 1, verse, Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them uh, uh, for, have, from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the land of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Opah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. Uh, it is obvious, I believe, again, kind of reading between the lines, that they had lived with this Jewish family. They had married sons of this Jewish family. They had observed, not just standing back and watching, but had practiced the, the customs of this family. And through them had come to know of the God that they worshipped. And said, Ruth clave unto her, and, and Naomi said to her, she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death, part thee and me. Now that's quite a statement. And that phraseology, those words have been used many times in, in weddings and marriage as part of the vows that the wife makes to her husband. And so we see something here of Ruth's commitment here uh, to uh, Naomi. I believe she had been converted. Or at least she acknowledged here the God of Naomi. Whereas the other daughter all said she went back to her former God. She, she not only returned to her family, and return to her people, 
and, and to the customs of her people, but to the God of her people. But Ruth, said, no, I'm not going back to that. Um, so this is some of the background. We see uh, Bruce's commitment here to Naomi. And there's a, a, a lot of things, some thoughts that I had on that. As Naomi perhaps represents that, because you know, they speak of this as a Judeo-Christian uh, belief system and so on, because the Old Testament forms the background, the foundation upon which the New Testament rests. And so it's a, a, a combination of these things. And I think Naomi here kind of represents that Old Testament faith of God's people. And we have come to believe, and there are people that come to believe in the God of the Jewish people, the God of the Old Testament, Jehovah. And I believe that is what uh, Ruth had come to do. She was a Gentile, but she had been brought into a knowledge and a worship of the one true living God through her attachment to Naomi. And so uh, she went with Naomi and they returned to the town of Bethlehem uh, of Judah. But how do they make a living? I mean, she returned to the, the, the homestead, if you will, the inheritance there. But she had no husband, she had no sons. And so there was built into the, the laws of the Jews, the customs of the Jews, God provided for. And how many times, you know, we, we read in the Scripture reference to the widows or the fatherless. Those who were without that means of support and protection. And so there were uh, built into their, their laws uh, certain things respecting that. And, and one of the things, and, and we see that they returned at the time, it was at a harvest time, it was the barley harvest. And uh, so they had what they, they would, the harvest time as they were harvesting the fields, those who owned the fields, those who had property, those that inherited and had servants, as they would harvest those fields, they were to allow those without means, without land, without support, to come in behind their servants and glean. You know, any uh, anything was left over. And they were allowed to do that. And so they when well, the harvesters were going through, they weren't to harvest everything. They were to allow they was to leave some so that those who were gleaning the fields would have something to live on. And so that's what uh, Ruth was going to do. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, was older. And so Ruth took upon herself that responsibility and she went into the fields to glean. And we see here in verse 2, uh, her, her trust, if you will, that God would provide for them. In, in verse 1, said, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, and the, of the family of Emelech, and his name was Boaz. Now it mentions that first. Now Ruth wasn't aware of this. Verse 2, and Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. You know, when she's going out, I said, I don't know, but I figured, someone's going to let me glean in their fields. And she was a Moabite. And, and I'm not sure what the difference in their 
outward appearance may be, if she still wore the clothing or, or what, but you know, you could tell she was not one of them. She was not from around there. And, you know, some of the people may not have allowed her to glean in their fields. But she was trusting the Lord would provide someone that would allow her to glean in their fields. That's what she's saying here. I shall find grace. And she said to her, go my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hat, that is, it just so happened. You know, someone today might say, well, her luck was that she happened to be in the field of Boaz. It just so happened. That's what that word hat means. Was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Himalek. I mean, of all the fields in all that area that she might have gone to, and I don't know where this field was in relationship to where Emelech's home was, where Naomi and them were staying. I, I, I don't know. But as it was, it just so happened that she was in one of the, part of the field that belonged to Boaz. Now, we know there's no such thing as coincidence in the, the things of God. Um, she came to glean and to light upon part of the field belonging to Boaz. Uh, there, there's just no accidents, no coincidences with God's sovereign providence. What a, a lesson here. You know, we, we read these things and sometimes, you know, we just need to stop and, and think about this. Boaz was not the only field around there. And she wasn't familiar with who people were and things. She just said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to glean and, and God will provide, you know, someone will let me glean in their field and whoever lets me glean in their field, I, I'll glean there and I'll bring something home for us to eat. And so, we read in Romans 8, 28, Paul says, all things work together for good to them that love God. God, who are the call according to His purpose. That was Ruth. And it worked together for good. And uh, it's her hat. <laughs> I like that phrase. And so what we see here, it says, Ruth found grace. Now, she knew she needed grace. Before she left Naomi, she said, said, I'll go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. See, no one owed it to her. Humanly speaking. To allow her to glean in their fields. I need grace. We all need grace. Grace by the grace of God. And she found grace. Um, we see in verse 10, she asked him, why have I found grace in thine eyes? She found grace. Um, one of the things we see Beginning in verse 4, Boaz sees her and he inquires after Ruth. You know, he comes along and he's watching his servants out there in the field and he has one servant that's kind of the overseer under him to make sure that the servants are doing what they're supposed to do. And he notices Ruth. And so he calls his head servant to him and said, Whose damsel is this? Uh, verse uh, 5. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? 
who does she belong to? He could tell she was perhaps a foreigner. She herself, um, in verse 10, when she says, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldst take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? So you can tell I'm a stranger. I'm not from around here. And so Boaz sees her gleaning in the fields and he asks his servant, Who is, whose damsel is this? You know, to what family does she belong? And of course, the, the servant had found out, um, said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not my daughter? Fear it. No, said, Hearest thou not my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from thence, but abide here fast by my maidens. And go, and he goes on. He says, you stay here and you glean in my fields. You can drink with, if you get thirsty, there's water here that my servants have. You can drink of my water and so on. So we see God's providential care. He instructs her to glean only in his fields. I remember somebody pointing that out and was saying, you know, there's a good message just in that to the Lord's people and His churches. You know, we don't need to go gleaning in somebody else's fields. God provides everything we need right here. We don't need to look anywhere else. And, and actually, it comes back to that. Uh, Naomi says the, the same thing in verse 22. Uh, when uh, Ruth comes back and tells her what all has happened. And Naomi, you know, blessing the Lord as she's beginning to see how God is working these things out. And, and so uh, she tells her in verse 20, Naomi said unto Ruth her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. See, it's good that you go with his maidens. Don't let them see you in somebody else's field. No. Um, so you, we need to be faithful to the Lord. We don't need to go into any other field. Uh, and, and we see how God's providential care for His people in general and His church in particular. You know, we, we quoted there in Romans 8, verse 28, all things work together for good, but we also see in Romans 8, verses 31 and 32, uh, where uh, he, he says here, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? But wasn't that what Boaz was doing? He has freely given her all things. God, you know, this world can be a very difficult place to survive in. You know, there are those natural things like the drought that had hit Israel. Uh, there are so many things in this life. The economy goes up and down, you know, and when it's down, it's it's difficult. You know, it's hard to find, sometimes it's hard to find jobs. Uh, things are so expensive. Uh, all, all these problems of life. There are the natural disasters, you know, hurricanes and tornadoes and floods and these things that makes life difficult. Uh, but God you know, takes care of His people. He protects us. He shelters us. He feeds us. He provides for us. He gives us the health and strength to be able to go out and work. He provides jobs for us. You know, and those things that, that are necessary to sustain us. God says, you glean here in my fields. Don't go anywhere else. 
Because in his fields, there is a steady supply. You know, that, that old adage kind of applies to this. You know, when people think that the grass is always greener in the other field on the other side of the fence. Not really. He make it to lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside the still waters. You know, his fields are the fields that we need to be in. And there is no limit, there is no end to His supply for us. Um, it is good for us to dwell and to glean in His fields. But Ruth questions Boaz's favor. Verse 10, we've already quoted this. You know, when, when he said these things to her, she realized she had found grace in his sight. She was, she was going to be allowed and given a, a place there in his fields that she could glean there behind his reapers and so on. And she asked, why? Now, why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldst take knowledge of me? Seeing I'm a stranger. You know, how many of us as a child of God sometimes have asked, God, why did you have grace on me? There's nothing in me that should have attracted your attention. There is nothing in me that I've done that is should prompt you that, that would deserve or merit your taking knowledge of me. Why? And boy has answered her. And I think there's some things here you know that we can think on. It hath fully been shown me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband and thou hast and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore you know the thing she had done he knew and it's not that we're saved by our works. But she had come to believe in ha having seen the God that Naomi and, and her husband and, and her sons, her husband, worship. And she had come to believe in Him. Now, the Bible says, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and they tremble. Just believing in God doesn't save someone. But how we respond to that, I believe, reflects something that is there. When we read over in the book of Acts, I was reading about Cornelius. Um, Acts chapter 10. verses 1 through 4 said there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius a centurion of the band called the Italian band a devout man and one that feared God with all his house which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always so he was a godly man 
but it was lost. Here's another Gentile that had come to believe in the one true God in Jehovah. And to the best of his knowledge, he was doing right by God. And he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming unto him and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to them, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. God knows. And I believe that that God's elect, even when they're lost, respond differently than other people. Now we was kind of laughing this morning when Lou was talking about when she was a Methodist and she was lost. And she could see church true, local church from the Bible and was questioning some things because that, that just wasn't what was in the Bible. Everybody else around her read the same scripture and all. They didn't see it. And we see how God used those things and little by little brought her to, to question and to ask and brought her to a knowledge of the truth and brought her to hear the gospel and the Lord saved her. I teasingly said that, that E was showing on the forehead. Um, they're, they're, you know, God's elect. He has an elect people. We don't know who they are. But I do believe there is some evidence in the Scripture that indicates that even when they are lost, they question, they seek. I remember, I was never even raised in church. Been to church a few times, weddings, funerals, things like that. But I questioned, I wondered about it. I would remember, and I can remember the room, I can remember the house where we lived when I, I thought this. But I tried to imagine what it was like to be dead. There was just nothing, and I, and I couldn't, really, I hadn't been taught anything, but I couldn't really conceive of the just being not existing, not being aware of existing. And so I thought about some of those things, even as a lost person, never having really been taught anything. And how little by little God brought me to the place to hear the gospel and to hear it. And I think that's what Boaz is talking about here as we apply this and we think about our, our relationship with God. Our life is not a secret. It's not hidden from God. He is fully aware. And we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. And that's what Ruth said in the beginning. I need grace. I need to find grace in somebody's eyes. And she found grace in the eyes of Boaz. <laughs> and she had, why? <laughs> you know, we know that's what we need and God gives it, but then we still say, well, why? Why me? Because we feel unworthy. And we are. That's what grace is. It's unmerited favor. And it, you know, when Paul was writing the book of Timothy, he says that this is a faithful saying. 1 Timothy 1.15 This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I think Paul said, why me? I'm the chiefest of sinners. Why did I find grace in the eyes of God?
He hadn't done anything to merit God's grace. He had persecuted the church and thought he was doing God a favor. And we all feel that way, it would seem. But he says, Thou art come to a people which thou knewest not heretofore. Thou art come to trust. Verse 12. Said the Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. He said that's why. You have put your trust in the one true God. And you've sought shelter under His wings. Therefore you found grace. You know, it's all in His Ephesians 2, 8, 4, By grace are you saved through faith. And we find grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we see God's providential care for His beloved. Um... In chapter 2, verses 15 then through 17, after the exchange between Boaz and Ruth, then Boaz says to his servants, you know, Ruth had found favor in his sight in more ways than one because eventually we see that he marries her. He does the part of the kinsman redeemer, which is and that's one of the reasons we know this was intended to teach us some things about Christ. Because God included in His laws about the kinsman redeemer that if for any reason a, a property or even a person had to be sold, the nearest of kin was given the opportunity. He had the... Uh, Dibs, I guess you would say. I, there's another phrase in it. This, I can't think of it right now. But he had that first opportunity to redeem and buy it so that the inheritance remained within the family. And then, of course, every 50 years, everything reverted back to the original owners anyway. But we see here that Boaz, being that near of kin, was in a position to exercise the right of the kinsman redeemer. And he redeemed the land that had belonged to Imelech so that it didn't just set barren, lay barren. He redeemed it, but he also redeemed the wife. And as one of the things that uh, is set forth in there, you could redeem property, you could redeem people, you could redeem a wife. And so he redeemed Ruth and married her um, as the near kinsman. And so these things are here to, to teach us about Christ and what He does for us. And we see His providential care. It didn't just end there, but He goes on and gave instructions to His servants in verse 15. And she, when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not. You know, where they was reaping it and they was binding the sheaves and let her take some right out of the sheaves. That part was not intended for those that were gleaning to get into. But she was allowed to. Um... And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her. Handfuls on purpose. You know, these are special blessings. I mean, it was one thing. They were allowed to glean. The reapers were not to harvest everything. They were to let some remain so that those gleaning in the fields would have, have something. 
But above and beyond that, he said, you, you let fall some handfuls on purpose. See, that was a little extra measure. That was kind of above and beyond. There, there was a sermon, I actually have a set of books that was written called Handfuls on Purpose. Uh, and it takes its title from this phrase here. And what he's saying to his servants, you know, you're going along and you're reaping. And here's some corn here that you have reaped. You let it fall in her path. So she has this extra. Uh, God gives us so much. He gives us more than we deserve as it is. But here we see He gives more than that. <laughs> he gives handfuls on purpose. His angels, His servants go before us. Preparing the way for us. And He's instructed them to leave us some handfuls on purpose from time to time. Now he, he provides for us. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. And I quote 20, verse 21 a lot. Unto Him be glory in the church. But the verse just before that. Now unto Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without. Unto Him. Notice, who is able to do exceeding abundantly? Now He, he does so much. He, he is able to do more than what we really comprehend according to the power, His power that worketh in us. You know, He dwells in us, His Holy Spirit seals us and, and, and works in us, and there is power there, and He's able to do so much. above and beyond what we even think. And what we can think to ask. Isn't that a blessing? 1 Corinthians 2.9 But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. He's prepared. And He told His servants as they go forth, you leave, let fall some of those handfuls on purpose for them. He's already prepared it for us. He's given instruction to the angels on our behalf. And there are things that He has laid in our past that we haven't come across yet that will be a blessing to us. And when you come across it, realize that was one of those handfuls on purpose. You know, there, there are times, there are things that we need. And we go to God in prayer and we pray and, and ask God to grant us these things and He does. And we're thankful for those things. But how many times has He surprised you and given you something you didn't even ask for? When He does, it's a handful on purpose. So we spend our days, the days of our sojourn here on earth in this life, gleaning the fields of our beloved. We said before, don't go into another field. You don't need to go into another field. I mean, everything that you can think of, everything that you could desire, and then some, 
will be provided for you in His field. He's provided for us. Rejoicing and being thankful for His providential care for our lives. Like Ruth, we have found grace in the eyes of the Lord when we have come to trust and to shelter under His will. We said eventually Ruth was redeemed and married to Boaz. And so his church has been redeemed and one day soon married to Christ. But in the meantime, he says to us, Will you stay in my field. Don't let my servant see you in somebody else's field. You stay in my field. That's where you belong. Let us stand together then at this time.